Hello, everybody. Uh, great to see you all back at the school. I'm Steve Call. I'm the, your dean of the Graduate School of Journalism, and it's wonderful to see such a full room and so many uh, classes represented today. Um, I want to first uh, thank Maria Newman, thank you. I uh, who you is back. the uh, Director of Alumni Relations. She and her team work incredibly hard. I hope you can see that in the organization of the weekend and the panels that they've put together and all the preparation. We're very grateful to, to, to Lauren Schaefer and Maria for their work to make this weekend happen. Um, I want to just offer a few remarks before we turn to the celebration that brings us together for the, uh, the luncheon. And the first thing I want to do is acknowledge, as I'm sure many of you have had reflections about uh, this week, the loss of uh, Joan Connor, who was the dean of the graduate school for eight years, uh, between 1988 and uh, the late 90s, and then remained a tenured member of the faculty uh, and a publisher of, of Columbia Journalism Review until uh, she retired um, in 2006, I think. Um, Joan was uh, a very good friend and counselor and very generous uh, with her time and her philanthropy at the school. She was a champion of Columbia Journalism Review in particular, where she worked with uh, Neil Barsky. We'll, we'll hear more about him in a minute. She was just a, a, a remarkable um, woman. Uh, I think when she was appointed, she was the first and perhaps the only woman to be a dean at Columbia University at that time, as hard as that might be to imagine. Um, and she did so much for the school uh, at a time when the university and the school had a kind of troubled relationship in some respects. She oversaw the beginning of the PhD program at the school, which contributed to the school's kind of credibility and, and contributions in research. And she... Um, she just saw the school through a, a really important time and left it much stronger um, for her leadership. And she's been such a great friend of the school since then. So I just wanted to acknowledge her and, um, and, and say we're very sorry for, for her family about uh, her, this loss this week. I want to give you a few notes um, of update about, about your school. These are obviously unusual times uh, for journalism. And it's a great privilege to lead an institution like this um, to defend journalism, to defend the values that we all share, and, and to defend uh, the credibility of journalism, both by speaking out, by contributing uh, through the Columbia Journalism Review, through research that we produce at the Tau Center, and just by uh, collaborating with other journalism organizations, and also, of course, by preparing journalists uh, to come out into this environment and, and contribute right away uh, with the kinds of strength uh, in reporting and professionalism and ethical eyesight that has been so critical at the school for 100 years or more. And uh, so I would just wanted to mention a couple of uh, priorities that we've been working on over the last year or two. And one is the Columbia Journalism Review. Uh, which, which Joan did so much to support when she was here. Um, it's had an incredible year of coverage, both digitally and uh, in print magazines. It was a finalist for the National Magazine Award for an issue it brought out about Trump and the press. Uh, and it has been in the forefront covering social media and journalism, the crisis in local news, and uh, really in, in full throttle these days. And I'm very proud of Kyle Pope, the editor and publisher, for the work he's done. And I would urge all of you, uh, if you're not members of Columbia Journalism Review, we've converted to a digital first strategy and, and operate now on a membership uh, basis, uh, consider, consider joining us that way. Um, we've also been very active in trying to hold Silicon Valley companies accountable for their role in the public sphere and in their role as um, distributors of journalism. One of the big things, as you all know, that's happened to our profession over the last five years or so is that publishers and broadcasters have lost control of their own distribution uh, and now have to rely on social media platforms to reach 
important sections of their audiences. And yet, as we've seen in the headlines over the last couple of months, uh, Facebook in particular has been very slow to accept the, its role as a publisher or a distributor and, and ambivalent about what kind of obligations it has to the public as a distributor of news. And so um, one of our colleagues, Emily Bell, at the Tau Center for Digital Journalism has been carrying out really influential research about these questions. I think she serves as an independent uh, critic of these companies, but from an evidence-led research position, not uh, kind of an opinion writer's position. And she's brought forward um, really important insights over the last year about what's actually happening on Facebook with propaganda, manipulative content. There's a research scientist now at the school named Jonathan Albright whose work has been on the front page of the Times and the Post. Uh, it was one of the first to establish the scale of the distribution of uh, Russia-originated content during the 2016 election through his own independent reporting. So we're, we're looking for opportunities to keep contributing in this way over the next year or two while, while tracking the threats that our profession uh, does face, both physical threats, online harassment, uh, and threats to um, the very credibility of professional journalism that we um, intend to defend. So uh, it's a great time at the school, I would say, overall, as uh, as a steward of the school and, and of the student body, that as disruptive as the last couple of years have been, um, they've also really strengthened the environment at our school. They've clarified for a lot of young people who come to school what it is we're teaching and why we, why we teach it. After, a, after an understandable period of some confusion among young people about what journalism actually is and where is it going and who's a journalist, that has all evaporated over the last year or two. I think we have the sense of our students as everyone sitting up straight, paying attention. They've got questions. If I'm a person of color, how do I go out and report on a neo-Nazi in Charlottesville? How do I conduct that interview? Those are the kinds of questions that our faculty uh, is very well positioned to address. And they have to do, and it's made it very um, easy for us to emphasize the core value of reporting and investigative reporting that lies at the heart of our curriculum and our place uh, in journalism education. So we have lots of new programs coming. There is a new program in data journalism, uh, three semester degree program that launches this summer for the first time. We're very proud of our push into computational and data journalism. But at the heart of the last couple of years remains a faculty that is absolutely dedicated to teaching reporting, writing, and how to think, how to find a story, how to, how to clarify what it, what uh, to uncover um, important new information. So um, it's been a good year, despite all of the craziness. Um, and now I'd like to uh, turn to the purpose of this luncheon, which is to celebrate um, alumni who have distinguished themselves in, in our profession, uh, but also are beloved to us because of their connections to our school and their generosity. Uh, over the years with time and, and other contributions, and just to take pride in the strength of this amazing alumni body, which uh, is really a critical part of, of why students still come to uh, this school in such numbers and with such enthusiasm, is that your reputations, the network that you represent, the commitment that you show uh, to the school is one of our biggest calling cards when we talk to students about why they should come here at all. And so this is a chance to highlight a few people uh, who we're particularly proud of. And I have the honor to introduce the first uh, winner, and that's uh, my friend Neil Barsky, who uh, early in his career was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and he won the Loeb Award there for coverage of the collapse of Donald Trump's financial empire, or at least its temporary collapse. <laughs> uh, and yes. <laughs> uh, in, uh, in fact, in Trump's book, Art of the Comeback, he wrote, of all the writers who have written about me, probably none has been more vicious than Neil Barsky of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> After several years of working as a reporter for the Journal and the New York Daily News, Neil went into business, first as an equity research analyst at Morgan Stanley and then co-founding a hedge fund and went solo later with his own fund. He's had great success in uh, business, but despite that, he missed journalism. Uh, he told a Fortune reporter in 2013, I love 
getting up in the morning, looking in the mirror and saying, I'm a reporter. I took no great joy in saying, I'm an analyst or I'm a hedge fund manager. Um, and he was reluctant to leave, to, to leave his identity as a journalist, and, and he didn't. He returned to documentary filmmaking. He made a uh, highly acclaimed film about Mayor Ed Koch. Uh, he directed it. Um, he's, he joined the board of the Columbia Journalism Review um, and worked with Victor um, Navasky and, and myself when I came in to strengthen that organization. And then, um, in the midst of all of this, uh, he had the vision to create what is truly one of the most impressive uh, entrepreneurial nonprofit endeavors in journalism over the last 10 years. I mean, you, we certainly want to acknowledge the strength of what ProPublica has achieved, but after acknowledging them, the, the next biggest, uh, or the, the <laughs> equally, uh, <laughs> equal achievement is the Marshall Project, and, and distinct for its commitment to something that um, stretched the, the, the kind of fabric of nonprofit journalism by identifying a field that was underserved by investigative reporting and narrative reporting and, and real-time reporting, not just taking the idea of journalism writ large and building a nonprofit around it, but, but committing to covering uh, the subject of, of justice in our society, the criminal justice system. Um, it's now up and running and led by Bill Keller, the able former New York Times executive editor. And uh, the Marshall Project won a 2016 Pulitzer Prize in explanatory reporting um, for an amazing story that we still teach at the school um, about a, a sexual assault case, a rape case that um, went south in a bunch of different ways. So, Neil, for helping to pave the way for journalism to reinvent itself by looking for innovative ways to fund coverage and present it to readers, we are very pleased and proud to present you with this alumni award. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm a little conflicted standing up here. Uh, for the last, when I left journalism, I used to reflect on how self-congratulatory business we could have sometimes and how much we love to pat ourselves on the back, and now I'm getting this award. It's not bad. So uh, I'm very flattered. Um, and uh, in my day life, I have a lot to say. I have a lot to say about everything I've got to say about journalism. And once again, I, I, I give myself some pause. I'm, this crowd is almost the definition of preaching to the choir. So what I'm about to say may or may not be new or revelatory to people here. But hopefully it'll be the product or byproduct of my own experience. Steve's right. I've been very lucky. I've had a chance to navigate various businesses and industries. And uh, so I'd like to just sort of give very short outtake or takeaway from what I think I've learned. And then as long as I have the microphone, I want to sort of reflect on Columbia a little bit and uh, remember two really dear friends uh, who we've lost recently who really made a mark both in my own life and on journalism, and I'll get to them soon. Uh, as far as journalism is concerned, um, I think there are certain verities we all can sort of agree about. We are truth tellers, we're truth seekers, the best of us. Um, have no ideological predilections, and the conceit of journalism, which is one of the reasons I started the Marshall Project, is that if you merely tell the truth about the world in a democratic society, good things will come out as a byproduct. And a lot of this, these assumptions, I think, have been challenged lately, frankly, but it's something I still deeply believe in. Um, but through my own experience working in covering real estate people and being in finance and hedge fund managers and film, um, I've learned a few other things, I think. Um, namely, is that journalism, journalists are not particularly special in terms of how we comport ourselves. Most of us are highly ethical, and some of us aren't. And I'd say, frankly, that's also true in other industries. I met amazing people in the hedge fund business, as blasphemous as that may seem to, to say right now, and other areas. And I, I would just observe that the happiest, spiritually lightest people in the world are the ones that go about their jobs and do the right thing every day. 
And that is, if anything, that's what I've learned, that you can be morally um, pure and do the right thing in any business, and you can also do the wrong thing in any business. And sort of as my own marching orders, and I'm a parent, my son Davidson's here, if I can teach them anything, and I hope I have, that would be it, which is do the right thing. The second thing about journalism is that, uh, which distinguishes it from everything else I've done, is how much fun it is. Uh, I can say that, you know, we made a film and I've been in various uh, other areas. Nothing is more exhilarating or thrilling than to be in a big paper, in a competitive story, getting it first, getting it right, having the future effing president, you know, come after you. Uh, there's nothing more just thrilling. And so if there's no other byproduct of what we all do, at least we can take some solace in that we're doing something that at least, you know, we love going to work every day, which I think most of us do. But I think in ways I might uh, diverge from some people in the audience, um, maybe in terms of the academy, is that I now think that, that having fun and even doing the right thing isn't enough. I really think that if I reflect back on the world we live in, and I'm going to be preachy here, so just bear with me, um, I think ultimately our life, our jobs, our careers should be about something higher. And I think they should be about attaining justice. Um, we're very fortunate in this room. We're very fortunate in this country. And so I, I, I have sensed over my recent years that a lot of journalists are reluctant to say, I believe in this, that I want to fight for criminal justice reform or help eradicate racism or peace in the Middle East. There are all these higher goals which somewhere back here with many of us really carry, but we haven't quite yet reconciled how to apply that to the daily activities of journalism. And I just hope that none of us lose sight that I think 90 something percent of us actually went into the business for that reason. And so I'd like us to all remember that when we go forward. I know I'm preaching the choir, but that's what I think I've observed uh, as something that we really want to keep at the front of our minds. Now, very briefly, then I'll get off and, and, and listen to the other speakers. Um, I'm here with Duffy Cohn, who's my classmate and dear friend from 1984. Uh, I got a lot out of this experience coming to Columbia, as I suspect everyone else here did. I learned a ton. But one of the great legacies was the tremendous friendships I made uh, to this day. And um, one of the closest friends I had was Tom Wagner, who was in our class, who had a career that was sort of the classic old school journalism career that we all sort of had available to us, some more than others, um, and hopefully is still available. Tom was a school teacher in Boston, and at the age of 30, he woke up and he wanted to be a journalist. He came here. Um, he took Penn Kimball's class, as we all did. Uh, Robin Reisig, who's in the audience, was our instructor. We formed a really tight crowd. And Tom was our leader in every way, and all he wanted to do was get relocated to London, where his English wife Sally was from, so they could be in England. So this is how he got there. His first job was with the AP in Wetumpka, Alabama, where it's reporting for the Montgomery Bureau. Two years later, he went to Atlanta. Two years later, he went to the foreign desk at AP. They finally sent him abroad to India. Three years later, he was based in Tokyo, and then at long last, he was moved to uh, land, uh, London, probably three years ago. But it was, you know, um, and he was a fearless reporter. He went to, uh, he covered Iraq, he covered Somalia, Gaza, and in his whole life, he, uh, I don't want to be overly sentimental, but he is somebody who embodied the best quality of journalists, which is intellectual curiosity. He never lost his wonderment for the world. He passed away a couple of years, a year ago, and I just want to remember him. Um, as one of the true um, great uh, things I derived from coming here. The other uh, is somebody whose uh, class is here, Wayne Barrett, who became a dear friend of mine, who in some ways no, needs no introduction. He was a graduate of the school in 1968. He was an instructor here for many years. As many people know, he worked at the Village Voice for 37 years. And if you were a reporter in New York, as I was, in the 1980s and the 1990s, the guy you looked up to, the guy you wanted the, the pat on the back from was Wayne Barrett. He was fearless. He was uh, moralistic. He gave an interview to the New York Times once. He said, I was going to be a priest 
until I found out I couldn't do something, blah, 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 and he spelled it out in the New York Times. Uh, and he also happened to write the best book about Ed Koch, who I did a film of about. He did the best book out there about Rudy Giuliani. And yes, he did the, probably the most comprehensive reporting on our current president. I last saw Wayne uh, in the summer of 2016. He was ailing, he was in his home in Brooklyn, and he had his files spread out around his room and there had been over a dozen reporters from national news organization who had taken the F train to Windsor Terrace, and he was sort of selflessly helping them um, report on, on Trump and Trump's campaign. And I remember what he said to me is, is uh, he said many things, but among them was, follow the money, it's Russia. And he was obsessing at the time over the Trump Soho project, which is no longer has Trump's name on anyway. Uh, he passed away last year. Uh, he passed away on the day before Trump's inauguration. Um, as we know now, that for Trump, everything, there's a quote. Uh, Steve quoted something he wrote about me. What he wrote about Wayne was, um, Wayne Barrett calls himself, I remember this, in the same book, same chapter, uh, Wayne Barrett considers himself an investigative reporter. I think of him as a jerk. Um, and he took great pride in that. So listen, thank you very much. Uh, this is truly an honor. Um, thank you, Dean Cole. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I did have the great pleasure of working with Steve as chairman of the uh, board of the CJR for many years. Uh, I think Steve's uh, decision to integrate that into the fabric of the school has been a home run. Uh, I'm no longer part of it because I'm involved with the Marshall Project in some ways competitive hint, hint uh, to the journalism school, but it has really um, been so integral to my life, my career, and my whatever success I've had, uh, having come here and stayed in touch with the school. So thank you all, thank you for this award, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. During the last presidential election, the media drew some criticism for failing to capture the voices of some people, people who were struggling financially, socially, people who lived in news deserts, people who seemed invisible, people who seemed not to matter. Our next award winner, Alyssa Quart, class of 1997, has been mining those voices and those stories for years. She's now the executive editor of the nonprofit Exe Economic Hardship Reporting Project. She co founded its current incarna incarnation with Bar Barbara Enreich, the journalist and author. Its mission is to change the conversation about ri rising income, income inequality in America and to support independent journalists whose livelihoods have been undone by deep changes in the news industry in collaboration with local newsrooms. The third, a third of the project's writers are low income. Their stories have appeared in publications such as the New York Times, The Guardian, Vice, The Atlantic, The Nation, and The New Yorker. Lissa says the idea is to grow journalistic ecosystems in places that have been left behind. Alyssa has authored several books, and she also writes The Outclassed, a column for The, for the Guardian. Outclassed examines the workforce teetering on the brink of poverty. She also, also has a book, Squeezed, Why the, why the Families of America can't, can't Afford America. Is that right, Alyssa? Did I? Okay, it's it, it's the book is called Squeeze, coming out by uh, by Harper. It's called Why Families Can't Afford America. It's coming out in a, in a couple of months. Um, she's also is a poet, which is remarkable. Um, she's doing a lot of amazing things, um, and we're very proud to honor her with this award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. This is such an honor to be standing here before you. Um, 
And um, I will tell you a few things about what this means to me, but first I want to take you back in time. So I see class of 96 out there. Um, the year I started journalism was, uh, J School was the year 1996, the year AFDC aid to families with dependent children was repealed. And that was kind of a watershed moment in my life. I realized, wow, even with a Democratic president, we could really um, topple a lot of the things that are keeping uh, American society together. Um, I myself was living in a series of 19th century walk-ups in the East Village where uh, there was a bar below one of them and smoke would come on through a hole in the floor. So that was the, the setting where I applied for uh, J School. Um, I attended J School in 1997, the year of Monica Lewinsky, the year that Mary J. Blige was vocalizing all of her strong emotions on the radio. I felt the city and the country were large and exciting. I wanted to go out into it and get lost in other people's stories. I took the magazine class and told Michael Shapiro I wanted to write about America's oddest people, its subcultures. Uh, you can imagine what Michael said. <laughs> um, I did so on graduation for uh, a British newspaper, The Independent, that like so many British newspapers, simply love stories about ridiculous Americans. Um, and they, but I didn't really realize it, but at the time I was reporting on the sort of the end of the New York City demimonde as it was being gentrified out of existence. And that's important also. Um, this was the high flying late 1990s, so the perks of being a reporter were immediate. Strangers at parties actually understood what I did for a living and wanted to talk to me about it. I, I could pay my rent. <laughs> um, as a journalist, uh, people communicated with me and I communicated with them. It was nirvana. Uh, and that, out of that reporting, that early reporting, emerged my first book, Branded, about teenagers who were exploited by advertisers and marketers. And that was completed when I was 29. I reported it by going into their high schools where I was young enough to be mistaken for one of their friends watching them sell Angora sweaters and boy bands to their peers at the uh, behest of adult peer-to-peer -peer marketers. Um, and I got a lot of my reporting skills here at the, at the J School. I was uh, put co coin after coin into the payphone to get that one last call. And that was, that was all from RW1, right? So things were going swimmingly for me, but then around 2007, 10 years after I graduated, I started to see the opportunities for myself and my colleagues freelancers and authors diminish. At that point, though I was freelancing regularly and doing a column for CJR, again, Columbia Journalism Review is this important part of our lives, um, and I, I was immersed in the experience, the suffering of my friends who are writers and authors, and I was photographers, I was reporting on them. Word rates were dropping, many bright peoples were leaving the business uh, for academia or PR. I sometimes think the most talented of us are never even in the running, you know what I mean? Um, they moved upstate, they went back home, and uh, I was one of the lucky ones. I was surviving, but uh, I was sort of worried about all these people, and I saw that everyone was sort of looking to the nonprofit sector all of a sudden for support. And uh, I, I was actually doing the same. I did the Neiman Fellowship and the Pulitzer, but I was wondering, what's the economics of this? How are, how are people surviving? How are these organizations surviving? So when I actually got a grant from Barbara Ehrenreich for the first documentary I worked on, The Last Clinic, uh, which was about the last um, abortion clinic in Mississippi, I met her and uh, I realized that this was something that I could actually get behind and really work for. And I call it journalism, a journalistic social work, <laughs> because um, we're basically advocating for the reporters themselves. So it's slightly different than uh, what the wonderful work Neil does. It's, it's basically about the journalists. Um, and Barbara Ehrenreich and I have been sort of plotting to try to support uh, all many of the people that you might know. And after, after this is over, I welcome you coming to me with questions, if you're editors or if you're writers or photographers. Um, we edit the pieces and we give grants, as uh, Karen so kindly put it. Um, and uh, one of the things that we did recently was we just created a fund for the Denver Post reporters who were laid off of $10,000. Um, we're going to have fund five reporters, and uh, we hope 
that this will at least help a little to send a message. We also did this with DNA Info and uh, we wanted to call it the Joe Ricketts Fellowship, but we were worried we'd be sued. <laughs> so we didn't wind up doing that. Um, but we're sort of going, at, we're gonna particularly support um, journalistic uh, venues that are being shut down due to bad actors like uh, hedge funds or you know greedy, the gr greedy billionaires as opposed to the good billionaires the rest of us re rely on. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so that, that's, that's something that we're probably gonna do other initiatives like that. So I also welcome ideas if it's Tampa Tribune, et cetera, you know. Um, Another thing we try to do is address the news deserts. So we're going into Montana, um, Oklahoma, and other kind of western and southern states where a majority of uh, the local newspapers are like either kind of shrunk or they've disappeared. And we're trying to support individual writers in these places. We put their work in The Guardian and then they appear locally also. Um, we call that initiative On the Ground. So t look for that also. And as an editor and writer, I still care most about those marginalized by economics, strangeness, disability, talent, or even youth. I want journalists to press against the transactional nature of this country and the city where price tags dangle over so many human encounters. Um, I will close with the lines from my favorite poem by the poet George Oppen of Being Numerous, which I read that year I went to J school over and over. And I think it's pertinent to what I've tried to become. Obsessed, bewildered by the shipwreck of the singular, we have chosen the meaning of being numerous. Uh, the meaning of being numerous, I would contend, is why most people in this room are still journalists, why we battle on when the world tells us the profession is diminished. We might be tempted to turn back to the shipwreck of the singular to escape our current reality, but we choose the numerousness of journalism to sort through the stories of the multitudes in all their complex glory. Thank you. I'm so glad we're gathered in this lovely and historic low library, but I apologize for the lousy acoustics. Uh, feel free to raise your hands or give us a thumbs up if you can't hear us, and we'll try not to take it as a you know, sign that we're doing great up here. Um, we're not so soft-spoken, but um, if you can't hear us, let us know. Um, I'm going to introduce our next winner, David Gonzalez. Um, I met David Gonzalez when I joined the New York Times in 1991, and I was assigned to cover the Bronx with him. So this award is very special for me. David taught me about the borough of his birth, and he taught me, and he taught this Texas Chicana, some Puerto Rican slang, and other things about local customs. He also showed me his love of words, the magic of a good story, and how to look beyond the obvious. David, who is still at the New York Times, is one of the most fulsome creative journalists I have ever known. His talents know no boundaries, and he is hard to pigeonhole. David had no intention of becoming a writer when he went to Yale. He planned on becoming a doctor. He studied psychology, but when he graduated Yale, he saw himself as a photographer. He worked for a few years for social service agencies telling his stories through pictures. Then someone suggested to him that he should be a writer, and he took to it with gusto. He came to the J School, and I'm shortcutting his story here, but I only have certain time. And afterward, he went to work for Newsweek magazine as a national correspondent in Detroit and Miami. Then he joined the Times, where during a nearly three-decade decade long career, he has been the Bronx Bureau chief, a Metro religion writer, the About New York columnist, and the Central America Caribbean Bureau chief. His work has often focused on the city's neighborhoods and how they reflect the larger social and cultural issues in American society. He published a year-long look at the life of an undocumented family in New York City. Many of his stories were those that might not otherwise have been written for the world's paper of record that often forgets about certain communities and certain people. A common thread for me, David once said, is challenging the established narrative wherever I can. For the past few years, David has returned to photography. 
He is the co-editor of the New York Times' Lens blog, which has become the premier internet site for photojournalists from around the world. I try to think visually and keep my eye active all the time, he said. As a journalist, my writing was visual. I think my writing has helped my photography because my writing told me about storytelling and about narrative. I think both complement each other and strengthen each other in different ways. For bringing stories to, to us that we might not have read otherwise and for taking pictures that help us see in different ways, we are so proud to present this alumni award to you, David. Hello. Um, I'm a print person, so I have words on paper. Um, so, where do I start? Dean Cole, members of the faculty, family, friends, and classmates, those two tables from 1983. <laughs> um, it's a little intimidating to be here. Um, I mean, you know, I come from a class that has Pulitzer winners like Tony Horowitz. Geraldine Brooks, people like Debbie Sontag, Ron Suskind. I mean, it's like, what the hell am I doing up here? If, I feel like when I was in the Bronx once I had a show at Casita Maria, I was in a group show, and they gave me the mic at the last minute, say something, and I'm standing right in front of Grandmaster Melly Mel, the guy who did the message. And I'm like, here I am holding a mic in front of like one of the greatest rappers of all time. I made it really fast. I just got the hell off the stage. But here I am. A lot's changed from the days that we were here when we had these, remember those old Olympia typewriters that we had? That you could like probably create a coral reef with if you dumped it in the ocean. Uh, audio tape that we, remember we edited on the block with like scotch tape and a razor blade? And video cameras that required two people to go out and, and do your thing. It's pretty interesting. We all clamored for better technology, which thankfully the school eventually got. Now, well, we were here, but they got it, and they got ahead of the curve now, which is great. But you know, what we, okay, what I needed at that time was just to learn to be a reporter, to see, hear, and report beyond the obvious. Beyond, as my classmates here can attest to saying, Ken Oletta spoke today. How many of us were guilty of that? I know Helen's over there clapping. <laughs> The fact is, today we have technology in our pockets that allow us to research, record, write, and file. The city we report on has also changed, becoming cleaner and safer. Though who would have imagined Mott Haven or Port Morris in the South Bronx, which is sacred ground to me, being gentrified now, having luxury towers. I wouldn't have thought it 20 years ago. We changed too, hopefully at this school, learning the skills and figuring out what we would do after graduation. Some folks had very clear ideas what they were gonna do. Some did not. I was in the latter category, to be quite honest. But it was at this school where I met teachers who shaped me, who informed me, who taught me, and who above all encouraged me, who perhaps saw things in me that I didn't, who gave me the career that I've been really, really fortunate to have. You listen, I'm a Puerto Rican from the South Bronx. My parents came here in the 1940s with no education and just some dreams. Um, but of that generation who grew up in the fires, who grew up in the abandonment, who grew up when, uh, you know, Fort to City dropped dead, or as Roger Starr said, you know, plan shrinkage, let's feed your family less each day and maybe they'll all die and our neighborhoods can, we don't have to worry about that neighborhood anymore. Um, I was raised to get a good education, get a good job and get out of the Bronx. Journalism really wasn't something you considered. And if you were like me, an Ivy League kid from blue collar background who was Puerto Rican or black or whatever, there were other options besides journalism, much more attractive options, if you will. You know, journalists, if we, they visited our neighborhoods at all, really weren't seeing the complexities of life in our, in our neighborhoods, only the chaos. Like I said, I was raised to get out of the Bronx. Thank God Penn Kimball sent me right back to it. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Uh, Penn made sure that I went right back to the places that I knew and that I knew my way places that were familiar, places that I felt 
as much as I heard, saw, and understood, felt. That's an important lesson that he taught me that didn't, I didn't realize it sank in until eight years later, but it happened. Now Penn, some of you know, was a figure who either hated or loved. Well, you know, you know how I feel about him. I'm crazy about that guy. He gave me my career. He was my advisor also in, um, he was my teacher member reporting and my master's advisor. But it was in his class that he sent me right back to the Bronx, to the, some of the same neighborhoods where I'd grown up. He taught me to search for the stories that perhaps I only knew as someone who grew up there to write with grace, authority, and give the reader what he loved to say, and I know Robin Reisig knows this one, flesh and blood, living, breathing people. Look deeply at their lives, and also look deeply at your life and find the common ground, because we can't do that if we really, really work at what we do. He showed me how to look deeply in myself, like I said. I, my thesis was on Catholic education, and I wrote my first draft of the thesis and it, it had no connection to anything. There was no, you wouldn't have known that I'd actually had my life changed because of Catholic schools in the South Bronx. And he made me sit down and just say, tell me about your life. And we had a long talk in his office and he told me a little bit about himself. And that began a process of realizing there's something within me that I could tap as a very powerful resource, which is empathy, feeling connecting to the other person and then trying to figure out a way to get that feeling onto the page and then into the hearts and minds of the reader. I'm dealing with neighborhoods. I, I like to say I'm the first reporter that most people meet in the kind of work that I do, you know. But the biggest couple I got paid once was in Soundview interviewing voters. And a guy refused to believe I worked for the New York Times. I had shoulder length hair, you know, smoking a cigarette back then, jeans. And he, he demanded to see my ID before he talked to me because <laughs> he just wouldn't believe that somebody like that would work at the Times. Penn was responsible for sending me back into that world. He helped me get my first job at Newsweek and he set me on a career that over the years has taken me overseas on somebody else's dime, thank God. And back to the Bronx though, always back to New York City, always back to the Bronx, along with Karen Rothmeyer, who was my RW1 teacher. They both gave me the tools and again, the confidence to tell the stories that I wanted to tell, that needed to be told. Not stories about giving voice to the voiceless. The voiceless have very fine voices, actually. It's the question of whether the reporters have good enough ears to listen to what the supposedly voices are saying. Um, but I told the stories that he taught me to tell, which was flesh and blood, living, breathing people who were struggling against the odds, whether in El Salvador, whether in Port au Prince, and above all, whether in the Bronx because in this glittering city that we live in, where people want to go to the Bronx to see the Yankees or to drive through their weekend house upstate or in Connecticut, there are some really serious problems. Problems, as, as Alyssa said, of severe inequality that persists in this fabulous city of ours. I'm gonna be real honest now, or as Nicole Hannah-Jones said yesterday at a conference we had on diversity, I'm gonna keep it real now. I'm not sure where I would be without this school and the transformative impact it had on my life. I came here with no connections. I'm the son of a handyman. If I wanted to be a handyman, I would have been hooked up from the beginning. <laughs> but I didn't have connections. I left here with skills and a job that Penn Kimball helped me get. It's that simple. That simple. But is it? For a person of color, for the child of two Puerto Ricans who came to this city after the horrific events of the Depression in Puerto Rico, which make what happened here in 1929 look like a cakewalk. They came here not speaking the language, not knowing what the hell was gonna happen, and in one generation, their kid wound up becoming a columnist with the New York Times. It's not too bad. How does that happen? For people of color, it can be miraculous sometimes, I'm gonna be honest. Breaking into this business can be clubby, it's clicky, it's who you know, who you hang out with afterwards. It's never been easy. Even though today, it's more important than ever to make sure we have reporters that have the skills to understand different communities and reporters that come from those communities. Again, that's a really important thing to do. We need people who understand how our world is changing, how our city is changing. I can spend days reporting stories speaking just Spanish. In New York, I don't have to go overseas. Overseas is here. It's been here for a long time, actually. You know, but for students like myself, a person of color with no connections and no experience, because the only thing I did at Yale with the Yale Daily News was protest it when they would write articles that made fun of Puerto Ricans, I'll be honest. But this school gave us entree 
into journalism. This school made a difference, not just in our lives, but in the newsrooms that we would go to work at. It played a vital role then, it plays a vital role now. I have to give thanks to where thanks is due. To Penn Kimball and Karen Rothmeyer, thank you for your guidance, friendship, and above all, your patience with this guy. To this school, which has changed so much, and for the better, I'm not gonna indulge in, you know, nostalgia about the good old days. Like Koch said, you know, you can never bring back the good old days. <laughs> These are the good old days right now, and they're really good at this school. My wife works here. She runs the part-time program, and her name is Elena Cabral. And, you know, I see what they're doing here, and they're really pushing forward in really innovative ways that didn't exist when I went here. But Elena, you know, some of you know I've gone through some health issues in the last seven years. I mean, all I have for Elena is my love and my gratitude for all you've done in that time. Uh, in good times and in bad, being there and fighting for me when I was seriously ill and I couldn't fight for myself. And to our children, Sebastian and Paloma, <laughs> yes, Paloma, smiling, which her laughter is the best sound in the world when I come home. The only thing that competes with it is my son playing Led Zeppelin with big distortion on his Les Paul. <laughs> and Sebastian's over there thinking about guitars, I'm sure. Look, here's the deal. None of us, no matter how bright we think we are, gets to where we are alone, none of us. This school was one of the most important places in my life, as I'm sure it continues to be for young reporters, especially reporters of color. It gives them the tools and technology and the confidence to enter today's newsrooms. But just as important is how it teaches us to look at the world, how we connect. I mean, I'm grateful for all the people I've met along the way who have let me into their homes from the guy in Rabinal in Guatemala who recounted to me how he hid in a tree while the military assassinated his wife and kids and a lot more wife and kid, women and children in this village, that he would sit there and just tell me this story, a total stranger. That's a sacred relationship. You have a duty when somebody tells you that. But you know, I used to drive my friends crazy, like you know, Bob Nicholsberg, a, report, a photographer buddy of mine, Alex Quesada. I was always overseas talking about the Bronx. This reminds me of how they organized in this community. I'd go to San Salvador, and a Jesuit buddy of mine would show me how this church was providing food to earthquake visitors. You know, it reminds me of what we did in the South Bronx back in the day. I was always going back, drove them crazy. But the thing is this. I grew up when there were fires in our buildings Blocks, entire blocks were reduced to rubble, a city that exists only in imagination now. I taught on Charlotte Street, famous Charlotte Street where Reagan and Carter went. I taught photography there to kids. And when we taught them, they didn't tell me how horrible their life was. They told me about what they did, how they played, what their dreams were. They have the same dreams in terms of categories. They may not have the money, they may not have the connections, but they have a basic dignity that I felt it was my duty to chronicle, that not to just leave them as objects of pity or sympathy. That's not what it's about. But they let me into their homes, they let me into their lives. I'm very fortunate because I know at one point I was one of them. I was that kid on the street running around all goofy with my friends while abandoned buildings were around the corner, while fires woke us up at night. It's my duty to chronicle that world, to remind people that what I grew up in, what we grew up in, to the outside it looked like chaos and danger, and there were macro forces around all that. But in that supposedly dangerous place, there were human bonds that helped people help each other to move forward. That's one of the great triumphs. I mean, you could do it organized with like, you know, these nonprofit associations and development companies, or you could just do it like some of my friend's parents. Like, they knew some kid was having a hard time. Come on up, have dinner with us. It could be that simple. What I'm trying to do is basically say I've been very lucky. I'm just a guy from the South Bronx that got a bunch of really good breaks. And yeah, I worked my butt off. I did. I made some good choices. I made bad choices. I'm here now, so I have to thank you for recognizing that what I tried to do is write little stories about little moments that you might remember one or two of them and realize that this city that we live in, we're all interconnected whether you want to know it or not whether you acknowledge it or not. Thank you very much.
Hi, everyone. I realize I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Karen Toulon, the chair of the uh, alumni board. Um, being here today has reminded me of so many things. Listening to the past speakers, I've remembered so many wonderful memories, um, why I came to the school. I've remembered also being the child of immigrants and what it means to be someone who doesn't always fit in and what it's like being a little bit of an outsider. And sadly, most of all, I remember those manual typewriters that we had and how I struggled with those as well. Um, anyway, so the next uh, person that we're recognizing is Sam Rowe. Um, It goes without saying that Sam has been doing great uh, journalistic work for many years. He's a proud member of the class of 1986. And apparently he made it very clear to everyone, even then, that what he wanted to do was investigative work. One classmate told us, and I quote, he wanted the opportunity to search behind the respectable faces of government agencies, corporations, and social institutions. He was fascinated by small bits of information culled through keen observation and superior news judgment. But just so you don't think Sam was always so serious, his classmate also assures us that he had an outrageous sense of humor. Sam went on to work for the Toledo Blade, where he did stories about police corruption and the collapse of the Great Lakes shipping industry. He received his first recognition from the Pulitzer Committee in 2000 for a piece on the exposing misconduct in the beryllium Bel 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 industry. Goodness. He then joined the Chicago Tribune, where he was part of a team that won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize for reporting on a series uh, exposing hazards for children. Those stories pushed Congress to pass the broadest reforms of consumer product safety laws to date. Roe has been the Pulitzer Prize finalist four times since then. His stories have sparked new federal laws, product recalls, congressional hearings, and... Um, health and safety reforms, including a U.S. ban on the export of mercury. He has, in, he has uh, interviewed recently. Uh, he was interviewed recently about the stories he does that involve scientific research, and he says that he thinks journalists and scientists working together is one of the great, next great steps in journalism. He's also a teacher. His students note his passion and his dedication to his work. In March, he served on a passion, panel discussion at NICAR, a uh, conference uh, for investigative reporters. He urged reporters to remember to track down the biggest experts in the field and ask them one simple question, can you help me? It's a very powerful question. Sam Rowe, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, some quick shout outs. First to the class of 1986. <laughs> sitting, sitting right there, if you didn't know that. Um, my lovely and brilliant wife, Nara Schoenberg, who is not only my best friend, but the best editor I've ever had. Thank you. Uh, my children are here, Calvin and Zephy. They're 14 years old. Um, they're wise beyond their years. They give me blunt, uh, very blunt advice on my story ideas. I think every newsroom could have a 14-year-old in the newsroom. I think that would probably uh, help everyone cut to the chase a bit. Uh, their grandmother, the multi-talented Coco Swartchild, thank you for coming. She's been a big supporter of us over the years. Uh, last but not least, I am very, very honored to have at our table uh, my mentor here at J School, the professor who inspired me and hundreds of students who've come through the school for three decades. Uh, he's widely regarded as one of the greatest journalism instructors of all time, maybe the best. Again, I'm thrilled to have um, with us here today Columbia Journalism Professor Emeritus Melvin Mencher. Mel, could you stand up and take a bow?
So Professor Mencher was already a legend when I came to school here, and I desperately, desperately wanted to impress him. And the first few weeks of school, it wasn't really going all that well for me. He was singling out other students' work for, you know, excellent papers, but not mine. And, and this was really eating, eating me up inside. And I vowed that for the next assignment, I was really going to knock it out of the park and, and impress him. And I had seen in the New York Times there was a list of high schools and their truancy rates in Brooklyn, and most of them were, were pretty bad. And in some cases, more than half the students weren't showing up to school. But there was this one school that seemed to be um, bucking the trend. They, uh, their truancy rate was very low, attendance was very high. And I said, well, that's a good story. I'll go out there and I'll find out what they're doing right, and maybe we can learn from it, and I'll, I'll impress Professor Mencher. So I took the long train ride out there, and uh, I interviewed the principal, and he set me up with interviews with a couple teachers, and the, uh, head of the football team and a cheerleader and someone on the chess club and I you know asked them why this school was so popular and they all told me the same thing they said um, we're like family here we're we're nurturing that's why students come to the school and I said great and I wrote this all down right in great detail I wrote this all down and the paper only had to be four pages long and so I wrote 14 and uh, I also Put a graphic in the back you know this is before computers and so I got out a ruler and my colored pencils and I made this really nice graphic and you know how when you finish a piece of work and you really think you've aced it and you're proud and you're all puffed up and you go treat yourself to your favorite meal and everything I mean that was me that was me and I couldn't wait couldn't wait to get my paper back well you can probably guess where this is going so, <laughs> so I get my paper back from Professor Mencher and all it said on the top in red ink in red ink, it said, uh, this is long, but I think you missed the point. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? I, I was stunned, honestly. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So after class, I said, well, this is such a good story. I don't get it. And he goes, you're, you're, not, you're not thinking. I go, well, what do you mean? I go, it's, it's 14 pages long. I mean, look at, look, look at all these quotes. I mean, there's a, did you see the graphic? I mean, co I mean colored, colored pencils. And and he says, you're not even reading your own piece. He goes, look at what the last paragraph says. So I had a kicker, I had a last paragraph, and it said, quoted the teacher saying, yeah, students are here first hour, but by, by the time fourth or fifth hour rolls around, there were so few kids in my class that I often have to cancel class. And the professor mentor said to me, well, what's that tell you? And I like looked in blankly, uh, I don't know. He goes, well, you're, you gotta think. You can't write if you can't think. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I just got defensive. And he said, you know, you need to re-report that story. And he walked away. And this happened right out on the, on the steps of the journalism school. And I was in tears. I mean, I walked back to my dorm at the International House. And I'm 26 years old. And I've got tears in my eyes. And I don't think it was because I, um, I, I, I maybe didn't impress a teacher that I really admired. I, I think it was dawning on me that after five years of undergrad journalism education and two internships and some multiple jobs, it was dawning on me that I had no idea what I was doing, that I was clueless. And that, that's painful. That's painful to sort of recognize. But I did what he said. I went back and I reported that story. And that school, what they were doing is they were hiring truant officers to go out and they were literally dragging kids out of bed, bringing them in for first hour, counting them present, so statistically, they would be present and then letting them go. In some case, driving them back home and tucking them in. And you know, that, that's, and I, w I fell for that. I mean, I fell for that. And if that story would have been published, it would have been, um, it would have been the complete opposite of what I should have been. I would have been perpetuating a fraud. I mean, it was fraudulent, I wouldn't be perpetuating. And I learned a lot from that story and from Professor Mentor and what he was saying um, is that and you often said this, that journalism isn't just a craft or profession, it's a, it's a moral endeavor. And because we have so much power and so much influence to make change in the world that we owe it to the public to not just be good at what we do, but to be excellent at what we do. Because if we don't, we could, we could just be spreading falsehoods instead of, of, of unveil, revealing the truth, what we're supposed to be doing. So that was really important to me. To me, that um, taught me 
that there was a sense of purpose behind journalism. I think up until then, I, purpose was not part of my equation in journalism. It was, I, I wasn't even part of my vocabulary. So thank you so much, Professor Mencher. Thank you for Columbia University for giving me purpose. Because I gotta tell you, over the last 30 years, that has really served me well. It's, uh, it's allowed me to be ambitious in my story selection. It's allowed me to be bold. Uh, it's allowed me to go toe to toe with all sorts of people from uh, politicians to corporate lawyers and to sometimes my own bosses. And um, I just end on this last note is that um, all my stories, I think, all my investigations have a large dose of Melvin Mentor in them, a large dose of Columbia University in them. And um, if, if, if you go back and you look at all the other work that's been done by students at this school, and you multiply all that together, that it's the impact that we have had on society has been tremendous. It's just awe-inspiring. Just from the stories I know about, just I can tell you for a fact that the air is cleaner, the water is purer, food is safer, many schools, hospitals, and nursing homes are better, cases of police brutality have been exposed, innocent people have been freed from prison, and corrupt leaders have been brought to justice, all because of the journalism school, all because of our school and what we stand for. And there's been a lot of talk in our industry about transformative change, let me tell you, that's transformative change and it's been going on here for decades. So I don't think it's an exaggeration to say you'd be hard pressed to find any institution or group in this country that has had more of a positive impact on society than this J School. And I'm really, really proud of that tradition and I'm proud to be one of you, a graduate of this great school. Thank you. all of you, so inspiring. Each year we present a Founders Award to an alum who has made particularly deep and, and lasting contributions to the school. And this year, it's my pleasure to introduce the winner, Gene Gleason. He's a graduate of the class of 1973. Yay! He spent uh, 30 years as the news anchor of ABC's Eyewitness News in Los Angeles until he retired in 2010. His broadcasting career began during his teenage years in his hometown of Riverside, California, when he worked as a disc jockey. And he had plans to go to law school, but he was drafted into the military. He soon found himself stationed in Germany and at the network head headquarters of Armed Forces Radio. And on the spot, I decided news was my future, not law, he said. Another great thing happened to him while he was in Germany, which is he met his wife, who's with us today. Uh, and thank you for coming, Trata. When he returned stateside, he attended the journalism school and then returned to California, where he was hired as a reporter at KABC. And he's covered everything since then, from the space shuttle program to the LA uh, riots, the OJ Simpson trial, and even back to Germany to cover the fall of the Berlin Wall. Throughout his career, Gene has never forgotten the J School. He has the longest continuous giving record to the annual fund of any J School graduate. He's also an incredibly thoughtful traveler and reader. Uh, just find him to be such a rich and thoughtful um, example of, of the finest of broad, broadcast journalism. So it's with real pleasure that I present this Founders Award to Gene and welcome, welcome him to the stage. Well, I want to thank Dean Cole, faculty, uh, students, current students at the J School. Uh, you're in for a great ride if you have anything ahead of you as we did. Um, I never had Mel Mencher as a professor here, but I did hear a story yesterday that I have to pass along. I haven't confirmed this story yet. We all had dinner last night, so this came up. There's always a Mel Mencher story. 
and it was about Sally Bedell, one of our graduates in the uh, class of 73, who I just saw a couple of months ago in, at a library function, uh, foundation function in Los Angeles. And uh, Sally has, was a great journalist in Philadelphia and, and at, I believe at Newsweek or Time Magazine and in her day, but then started writing books about the royals. So with this, uh, this sort of pedigree, uh, the story sounds like it probably is true. I understand that when she came to your class at first, she was probably the best dressed, best looking, most erudite person uh, in your class. And your first assignment to her was to go do a story on the sewers of New York. <laughs> and I thought, that is so typical of, of uh, what happens at the journalism school. It strips away all of your pretensions and sends you off to places you never thought you would be. And it, and it forces you to make decisions and, and talk to people and, and, um, and go into the lowest portions of a society and do real stories, tell their stories, and bring them to the forefront. Uh, coming to New York in 1972 uh, was quite an adventure for me. I mean, I grew up in a, in a town that's much bigger now. It's part of the megalopolis of Los Angeles. But when I was growing up, it was uh, two blocks away to the orange groves. And uh, we'd go down to the Santa Ana River bottom with our shotguns across our bicycles and wave to the cops as they went by because we were down there shooting tin cans and stuff like that. So it was an entirely different era. And, of course, many things happened in between that early 1950s period until the, uh, until the early 70s when I came to New York. And New York was a rough place in those days. We had a professor that was murdered just a couple of blocks from here about two, blo uh, two weeks after we got to school. My wife and I looked and said, my goodness, uh, what kind of place is this? Uh, New York Magazine had a, a story with every murder of one week, and I think it was like 150 or something. It was some huge amount with photographs and stories of every victim. And uh, to top all that off, one of the popular uh, movies at the time was The Out of Towners. And if anybody remembers, I think it was Jack Lemmon and Sandy Dennis, and uh, you know they were having their problems in the city of New York. And Trout and I are kind of looking at like, wow, what have we done? And then you get on the subway because you get an assignment and you're riding along trying to figure out how you're going to get to Brooklyn, Crown Heights, Brooklyn, if I remember correctly. And there's some guy sitting next to you. He doesn't say a word for the longest time. And I'm looking at a subway map trying to navigate the subway system of Los Angeles. And the guy leans over and said, where are you going? As I'm going to Brooklyn. It's a foreign country. I thought, well, I don't have my passport, but uh, you know, maybe I need one. Um, but and 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 the school at the time was uh, a little rough. The facilities weren't that great. I had already worked in commercial television, so a lot of what the television side and the broadcast side had was was kind of old-fashioned. Uh, but. I've been coming to reunions since 1993, and every time I come, I'm amazed at two things. How wonderful New York is. It was wonderful then, too, in a sort of a different way, uh, once you got to know it. But it is an incredibly vibrant city, always has been. But it, it, it just had life to it that didn't seem to exist at that time. I lived on West 93rd with my wife. We sublet an apartment. You couldn't go after dark north of 96. It was just impossible. But here we are in 1993. We were staying with friends down at 72nd Street, and we walked Broadway all the way to the school. And parks that were all rusted over and buildings that were all boarded up uh, were open and businesses flourishing and kids playing in the pocket parks. And I thought, what a place. If New York can do this, I'll bet Los Angeles might be able to do it too. They're still trying. They haven't gotten here yet, but they're trying. Um, the school has facilities that just 
blew me away. I'm, I'm walking through looking at their digital lab. And I'm thinking, my goodness, we don't have anything like this where I work. This is before they later sort of digitalized. Uh, but the school was ahead of, of so many uh, commercial organizations in a lot of the equipment they started uh, putting on in the 90s and then continued through. And the work they were doing was just terrific. And, and every time we came, every five years we would come back, and it seemed to me it got better and better. Um, when I got out of school and I worked here at uh, WPIX TV as a reporter for the summer, trying to decide whether I wanted to stay in New York or go back to Los Angeles. But it was interesting because uh, the crews that I worked with, and you talk about the old equipment, it was film. And even with film, there were three crew members that you were working with in every, in every unit at WPIX. There was a, a photographer, a light guy, and a sound guy, and the light guy slept all day in the back of the car. And you would go to a place like the South Bronx or Harlem, and there was a story to be done, they wouldn't get out of the car. They refused to get out of the car. And I'd say, you have to get out of the car, we have to go check on this story. You go do it. Okay, and you just have to suck up and go upstairs and start walking around, banging on doors, talking to people. Some would open the door, some would tell you to blank off. And, uh, but over time you'd get enough people that you thought, okay, I think I've got a, a handle on this story. And then you'd have to go back down to these guys and either bring the people down out of the building and talk to them on the street, or once in a while they'd, they'd be shamed into coming up and, and shooting it. But that, that was a reality at the time. Uh, you know, there was a, a tremendous amount of racism, and almost none of them, all of them grew up in New York, but none of them lived here. They were all coming from somewhere else. One, one crew guy I worked with uh, lived in Ronkonkoma, and I'd see him when I was leaving, it was at the Daily News building, and he'd be heading down to the subway uh, to go to the Long Island Railroad, and, and he said, Ronkonkoma, and I'm trying to figure out where that is. And, uh, and I said, well, how long will it take you to get you know, get home. He said, an hour and a half. I said, you go an hour and a half on the train every day? Oh yeah, I wouldn't live in this town for anything, is what he said. Now I think he's probably, or his kids are all trying to get into the city and pay a decent rent, which is another story. But it was a different time. Uh, it was a rough time, but a good time because of what everybody else has said. This is a school that puts you together with every type of individual from every background, and those backgrounds and those individuals make what you do better and better under the guidance of, of the faculty. Uh, I first walked onto this campus uh, in late August 1972 and scampered up the stairs trying to look around, went up to the, uh, up to the, uh, a school lounge, and there's Dan, War uh, Dan Webster asleep on the couch. Uh, I, at some point he got up and we introduced each other, and he was the first of uh, a great collection of individuals, hardworking, intelligent, interesting, and funny, that we ended up uh, uh, coalescing into the class of 1973. Uh, couldn't be prouder of people that I've worked with. We've stayed close all these years, as I know you have with your classes. Um, it was a perfect introduction. Uh, and Trout and I came to the school from San Diego at a time when San Diego didn't quite have the urban chops that it has now. Uh, but it had something I liked because I had graduated a year and a half before from San Diego State after I had served in the service. and uh, and interned and got a, a reporting job right off of the internship, but it was temporary and only summer. So I applied to school here, and it was kind of a, you know, a backstop. If I don't get that job, I'm gonna go to Columbia. Uh, it turned out I did get the job, and about three months later, I get a, a letter from Columbia University saying I've been accepted for the class of 73, and your scholarship uh, application is now being processed, and I thought, I don't remember applying for a scholarship, but that's awfully nice. Talked to my wife, and we decided, okay, if we get a scholarship, we'll go. And, uh, and we not only got the scholarship, it was a fellowship, and it came with uh, 
a payment for the tuition, which was, don't laugh, $1,500 a semester, and a stipend, which paid some of our expenses, which was very nice. And so then I have this idea, I'm going to Columbia, but I sure hate to miss this job. I went to my boss, Ray Wilson, who was the news director at KFMB Television, and he said, uh, you go. I'll give you a leave of absence. When you come back, you'll be a better reporter. And I, I have never forgotten that. Uh, I've never forgotten the generosity. I've never forgotten the, you know, the, uh, the faith that they had in me to do something that would pay them off in, in, in the future. Uh, and so I went to Columbia and learned a tremendous amount. When I got back, I wanted to do stories of every type that nobody else was doing in that town. And so I did, I looked around the border. Nobody was covering the border. Anybody heard of the border lately? So I covered illegal immigration, uh, drug smuggling, made a lot of contacts with the local uh, United States attorney and uh, immigration and customs agents. And uh, they were talking about a border fence because there was almost no fence in those days. And uh, so they, does this sound familiar? They, they talked about building a fence that might keep people out. And the guy who was building the fence, I got a quote from him saying, this is no fence, this is a tennis court fence. Won't keep anybody out. But, you know, if they want to pay for it, I'll build it. And they did, and of course it got torn down. Because they weren't thinking about what the overall interest of the people coming across was. They wanted jobs and they wanted to work. And America's been built on cheap immigrant labor, and so they're cheap immigrants, and they're coming to America to, to make their lives better. The Immigration Service and others, some understood that, but most just looked at it and said, we've got to stop these people. Uh, and of course, the immigration issue is forefront now. Uh, I covered it for probably a decade, and uh, I covered gun control. I said, nobody's doing anything on gun control. Let's do gun control. So we did a big series on gun control. Got called every name in the book. Um, did uh, cancer clinics in Tijuana. Uh, and we just did stuff at the border all the time. And it, it's so funny because now you look back and you think every issue is exactly the same issue as it was then. It has not changed. It's gotten bigger. It's more political. It wasn't so political in those days. But it's this, those are the same issues that affect us. So um, the, the, the university and the J School prepared me so well and prepared all of you for the, for the future of keeping journalism uh, on the highest plane and working as hard as you can. I have to agree with whoever said it's fun. You know, I've never been as excited as I am when I'm, you're digging into a story and you're finding things. It's just the greatest thrill that exists on the planet. And it's so good for democracy. It's the foundation stone of democracy, and we have to remember that. Um, and it's practiced by us, the well-trained and the highly motivated reporters. That was true in 1973, and more so than ever it is true today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Our last award is called the First Decade Award um, to recognize the accomplishments of somebody during the last, the first 10 years after graduation to see what they can do, um, kind of coming out of the chute, so to speak. Janelle Richards, who is with the class of 19, uh, 2010, personifies the values that we try to teach here at the journalism school. Let me adjust this a little better. Janelle is an Emmy-nominated producer at Nightly News with Lester Holt. She has covered Hurricane Irma, the Pulse Orlando shooting, the Charleston Church shooting, and the U.S. Embassy opening in Cuba, among many stories. Before Nightly News, she worked at Weekend Today Show and thegrio.com, where she covered education and women's issues within the African-American community. Earlier this year, Richards was awarded a grant from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting and traveled to Kenya to produce multimedia projects on the emerging technology industry. I'll just call her Janelle, not Richards, because we're not in a, news, in a newspaper article, right? 
Janelle embodies the best of the journalism school. She is curious, she is intrepid, she has made the most of her opportunities and she is generous about sharing her knowledge with other students at the school. Last week or a couple of weeks ago, she was at the journalism school talking to students about her work. She told them that every day at Nightly News is different and she never knew what the news would bring. For example, the day before she came to see us, she told them that at 6 p.m. with only a half hour to go before the nightly news was about to go on the air, someone came up to her and said, I need you to DJ something. Apparently DJ means interviewing somebody and getting them on camera. Stormy Daniels' lawyer is in the building. That was the day that President Trump had told reporters on Air Force One that he did not know about the $130,000 payment paid to Ms. Daniels to keep her from talking about the affair she had said they had had the first time the president had addressed the matter. It was a lead story everywhere. The piece would need comments from Stormy's lawyer, and Janelle would be the one to have to interview him. The lesson in that, she told the students, is be ready, relax. What you don't want to do is get asked to do something and not deliver on it. She found a place to interview the lawyer, found a producer who helped her because she asked the right way, Mike Tim set, him, set up the lights, made sure everything worked, and asked him the questions. And she delivered a finished package in time to round out Nightly, Nightly News' lead story. She told our students, my advice to is to just be flexible, be ready, keep your hustle up, and also speak up. If you're in any newsroom, no matter what the platform, who your team is, print, radio, you have to speak up. That's why you're there. Janelle, for keeping up your hustle so gracefully and effectively, we're proud to give you the First Decade Award. Thank you. Hi, I'm happy that I said the right thing. I didn't know she was taking notes, so I'm glad that I gave the right advice. Um, I'm honored to be here, and congratulations to the other honorees um, today. What incredible careers we've heard about, and I feel more motivated um, than ever. I want to thank my family that's here and also my colleagues at NBC News. Um, the doors of opportunity opened, and I ran right through them, and I'm so grateful to Lester Holt and our nightly news and NBC family. Um, it's been almost a decade since I graduated from Columbia, and I have to thank my favorite professor that's also here, June Cross, who was incredible, and I'm so, so happy that um, I lucked out with her as my RW1 professor. The rest is history. Um, I've been on the ground for some of the most tragic events in recent years. The Orlando shooting, the church shooting, they go on and on, and at a point, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And it's a reminder that covering these communities that are rocked by senseless violence is a heartbreaking experience. I'm often reminded that reporting with compassion is the first priority. In an industry that's fast-paced, I, I entered the workforce after Columbia with a strong foundation. I often put into practice today what I learned in graduate school. Pitching your perspective is a good thing. It makes you stand out. Diversity is a strength, not a weakness. Hard work and tenacity can get you pretty far. What I learned here at the journalism school has been critical to my career growth. I developed my instincts. Going above and beyond was the expectation that Columbia News Tonight set. Competition was fierce but was also the driving force for students to achieve their best. In 2009, there was a blizzard. 26 inches of snow fell from the sky and Columbia's entire campus was closed. But I had a professor who made it very, very clear that we, the journalism school, had class and that we would be outside covering the storm. <laughs> I teamed up miserably with my friend Carmen in freezing temperatures and we stood outside shooting stand-ups and MOS and we even got sent downtown to cover Mayor Bloomberg's press conference. This was a mini lesson in itself. When people run away, you run towards it. That's the job. I was rem reminded of that last fall as we drove around a fairly deserted Florida hopping city to city as we covered Hurricane Irma. When people run away, 
you run towards it. That's the fundamental of journalism. We get on the ground and we tell stories. The journalism school has ingrained in me to never lose sight of what our role as journalists truly is, to share stories of other people, to let them tell their story, to shed, to shed a light on what other people may not know, and to do so honestly and passionately. Journalists have been challenged for doing their jobs and telling the truth. It's a reminder of why covering history isn't easy, but it is a career that's allowed me to constantly learn. I've cracked open cocoa pods with farmers in Ghana. I've traveled to Kenya, Kenya and eaten goat on the side of the road with local entrepreneurs. I've flown on a tiny Cessna plane up to Lake Placid that sits nine people and you can feel every single cloud that you fly through. So Columbia, thank you for the skills to succeed and the chance to pave a way in an ever-changing building business. For the honor of receiving such an incredible award tonight, I'm excited for the next 10 years and the 10 years after that to cover some of the most memorable stories of this generation. Thank you. Thank you all for your patience and for your attention and for everything you do for the school. What a lovely celebration and what, what great sources of pride uh, all of you are. So thanks, enjoy the rest of the program, and we'll see you later. <laughs>